Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Unionville Baptist Church. As we gather today on Sunday, September the 13th. Who would have thought that it would be in so many months between when we first come back, but the Lord has brought us back, and we're glad to be here, those of us who are able to attend. But as we always do when we gather to worship, we worship our God and King who has called us here. And as we come together for that purpose, we will begin again with prayer and just commend ourselves to him and commit this time to him that he would make of it what he means to, to bring glory to his name and to bring, uh, to build his people up. So would you join me in prayer as we come together now as his church. Our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your goodness to us in preserving us through these months, these strange, very different times, Lord, challenging at times as well. But Lord, by your grace, you have kept us and we have been able to stay together through other means, but we're glad to be back today for the first time, gathered as a body in this place. But even so, we are reminded, Lord, that the place is not the church. We are the church and that by your grace. And so we thank you for calling us and for calling us together. We thank you for each one who is able to come. We understand that many others are not and we pray that your blessing be upon them as well as they too are part of your church. But bless this time that is before us, Lord. May it bring glory to your name and may it build your people up as we seek to know you more and draw near to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. power of Jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him That with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord. Worship His majesty Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise Majesty, kingdom authority Flow from His throne unto His own His anthem Exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify 
Christ Jesus the King Majesty Worship His Majesty Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings Majesty Worship His Majesty Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise Majesty Kingdom authority Flow from His throne unto His own His hands Up on high the name of Jesus Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King Majesty, worship His majesty Jesus who died, now glorified King of all kings on high the name of Jesus magnify come glorify Christ Jesus the King majesty worship is majesty Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings All the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me how great is our God And all will see how great How great is our God Age to age he stands Time is in His hands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The God had three in one A Father, Spirit, Son The Lion and the Lamb The Lion and the Lamb how great is our God Sing with me how great is our God And all will see how great How great is our God Name above all Worthy of all praise And my heart will sing How great is our God Name above 
above all names. You are worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. How great is our God. Would you sing with me how great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Indeed, Heavenly Father, we declare together as your people how great and awesome is our God. There is none like you. There is none, Lord. Beside you, there is no God. And we thank you that you, though you are so high and mighty and exalted, yet you condescend to make yourself known to us, that we might worship you, that we might know you, that we might know your blessings and your peace. So we thank you again that in your greatness, Lord, you have made us to be the people of, of your own possession, Lord that we might declare your excellencies in this world. And so fit us for that use, Lord. Fit us for that purpose. Equip us. Continue to use us and fill us by your Holy Spirit, whom you have sent to indwell us, that we might indeed walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling to the praise and glory of your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And just two more songs that speak of the Lordship of our God. He's been given the name that is above every name. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns All music but its own Awake my soul and sing Of him who died for thee And hail him as thy matchless king Through all eternity Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, rich wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified, no angel in the sky can fully bear that sight. But Bends his wandering eye at mystery so bright. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, who rose victorious to the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing Who died and rose on high Who died eternal life to bring And lives that death may die Crown him the Lord of heaven One with the Father and 
defied. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does his successive journeys run. His kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more to him shall endless prayer be made and endless praises crown his head his name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice. People and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name let every creature rise to bring his grateful honors to their king songs again and us repeat the loud amen amen indeed amen and before i invite the pastor to come we're just going to read a confession of our faith we've heard of the creeds this is a contemporary confession of our faith I know you don't have it before you, but trust that you will give your full affirmation because it is what we believe. And I just thought it's fitting for us to take the time as we come back together and just affirm this together, even though it may not be audible, but to declare again these truths that we hold dear. So if you had your hymnal, it would be number 718, a contemporary affirmation of faith. We believe in Jesus Christ the Lord who was promised to the people of Israel, who came in the flesh to dwell among us, who announced the coming of the rule of God, who gathered disciples and taught them, who died on the cross to free us from sin, who rose from the dead to give us life and hope who reigns in heaven at the right hand of God, who comes to judge and bring justice to victory. We believe in God his Father, who raised him from the dead, who created and sustains the universe, who acts to deliver his people in times of need, who desires all men everywhere to be saved, who rules over the destinies of men and nations, who continues to love men even when they reject him. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who is the form of God present in the church, who moves men to faith and obedience, who is the guarantee of our deliverance, who leads us to find God's will in the word, who assists those whom he renews in prayer who guides us in discernment, who impels us to act together. We believe God has made us his people to invite others to follow Christ, to encourage one another to deeper commitment, to proclaim forgiveness of sins and hope, to reconcile men to God through word and deed to bear witness to the power of love over hate, 
to proclaim Jesus the Lord over all, to meet the daily tasks of life with purpose, to suffer joyfully for the cause of right, to the ends of the earth, to the end of the age, to the praise of his glory. Amen. And if that resonates with what your belief is this morning, let God hear your amen. 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 Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is indeed good to be in your house this day that your people might gather to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we thank you that we can indeed gather in freedom and that we can, we can sing your praise and give you glory and worship and honor. So Lord, now as we would sit under your word, May the Holy Spirit instruct us, giving us ears to hear what he would say to us, hearts that are responsive to your word, and minds that discern. So bless us now, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin this morning by reading Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, to set the context for the message today. Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. The king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. The word of the Lord. It is unfortunate that so many people read the book of Daniel as though it only contained eschatology. They read it through a narrow lens, seemingly oblivious to the other grand themes of the book. In fact, eschatology is a subordinate theme in the book's overarching structure. The meta narrative of Daniel, that is its main theme, is the sovereignty of God. And the eschatological portions contribute to this main theme. Furthermore, the book of Daniel is a treasure trove of practical theology showing us how to live faithfully in the midst of an ungodly world. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 14 through 49, several prominent themes emerge or reemerge. Number one, the godliness of Daniel and his three friends. 
verse 14, verses 17 through 23, verses 27 through 30. Number two, the impotence of false religion. Contrast verse 11 with verse 28. Number three, the excellency and sovereignty of God. Verses 20 through 23, verse 28, verse 37, verses 44 through 45. And obviously eschatology, verses 31 through 45. When we look at the text, we see it in the context of what we just previously read. And so we'll pick up in verse 14. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. The execution of the wise men had not already begun, as a few commentators have suggested. Rather, Arioch is in the process of rounding them up for formal sentencing and then mass execution. Arioch is said here to be the commander of the king's guard. That phrase, king's guard, renders a term that has to do with an executioner. And so narrowly it would refer to those who uh, are sent on behalf of the king to execute those under capital sentence. But it's probably to be understood here as a broader term to refer to the king's guard or bodyguard. And part of their function was to carry out uh, executions, and obviously that was Arioch's role in, in this case. Arioch comes and he is about to bring along Daniel and the others to this sentencing and, and execution, and Daniel responds as he responded in chapter 1 with uh, godliness, with Christian character, reflecting the character of God. And uh, the text here says that Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He spoke to him in a way that was fitting as a believer and a way that is fitting to the circumstances in which he found himself. And earlier Daniel did this, for instance, when um, he speaks with Ashpenaz about having a change in diet and then uh, does it again to the one who is subordinate to Ashpenaz and commends himself to these individuals by his mannerisms, by his behavior. There is a way in which we can do things that is appropriate and a way that we can do things that's inappropriate. In the New Testament, we're told that even if we disagree, we're to do so in love. Love is to be the mark of the Christian. The character of God is to be the mark of the Christian. And Daniel reflects in his behavior that there's something different in him. And it's his relationship with God that, that comes right to the surface for all to see. Verse 15. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Now, most English translations don't use the word harsh. They use the word urgent. Or the King James Bible uses uh, the word hasty, and gives the idea here of, um, of, of a temporal sense of why is he doing this so quickly or uh, the sense of an irrationality to it. The word, however, comes from a root meaning harshness or stiffness. So the, the, the main meaning of this word would be harsh or severe, as John Golden Gate translates it in his commentary. If there is a temporal sense of urgency, it would be in addition to the idea of harshness. Daniel is, is saying that, why is the king going so overboard in what he's doing? Not only in the quickness in which he's doing it, but, but why is there a mass execution being ordered for all of the wise men? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time, whether directly or through Arioch, the text doesn't tell us. It would seem to imply more that Arioch uh, came and made the matter known to the king. The king granted uh, an audience uh, for Daniel. Daniel goes in and explains the matter to, to the king. And it says here that Daniel asked for time so that he might interpret 
the dream. Now, there's more going on than, than the little snapshot that the, the text gives here. Um, commentator Stephen Miller suggests that Daniel's request for a stay of execution was granted because he assured the king that his God, Yahweh, could reveal the dream and its interpretation to him within a reasonable interval. In other words, he didn't just say, King, give me more time. He said, King, give me more time because my God can do what you're asking him to do. In contrast to the perception of the wise men uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had, he didn't perceive that Daniel was stalling. You remember back in verse 8, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar says, uh, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize what I have firmly decided. In other words, they're just stalling. But he doesn't sense that in, in Daniel. He sensed that Daniel is genuinely going to seek his God for the dream and its interpretation. And remember, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't just want to slaughter the wise men. What he wants is to know what his dream means. He just doesn't trust the wise men. So if Daniel can come back in a short amount of time, tell him what the dream is, then he will know that the interpretation is sound. That's what Nebuchadnezzar himself had said. He says in verse 9, So then, tell me the dream, then I will know that you can interpret it for me. Then, verse 17, Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, certainly it concerns them. They're part of this group that's, that's going to be put to execution. But that's not the primary reason why Daniel goes to talk with them. Daniel is calling his fellow believers, his brothers in the faith, to pray, to intercede, to come before God. Notice here he uses their Hebrew names. He urged them to plead for mercy or compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. The word mystery has the connotation in scripture of not something that's mysterious, but something that cannot be known, cannot be discerned apart from divine revelation. So it doesn't matter how smart somebody is. It doesn't matter what instruments and things are at their disposal. It cannot be known. It cannot be known to uh, the angels, the demons. It cannot be known to uh, wise men or, 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 or the simple. It cannot be discovered. It can only be known through divine revelation. So... Daniel recognizes that only God can tell him the dream and its interpretation. So he tells them to plead for mercy or compassion. Now it's interesting it uses that word mercy or, or probably better translated compassion because Daniel realizes that he doesn't deserve that he and his friends don't deserve that God would bestow this, this grace upon them. He realizes that any good thing that God does is mercy, it's grace, it's compassion. It's not deserved, it's not earned. And so Daniel chooses his language here very carefully so that it is not implied in any sense that God is under any obligation to grant this request to Daniel. And that's important for us to learn when we pray that we never put God in our debt. God will never be obliged or owe us anything. Anything that God gives us is out of love, grace, mercy, compassion, but never obligation. And so he tells them to plead. This is just a wonderful word here, using the word plead. It has the idea of wrestling in prayer. 
It has the idea of, of being tenacious in prayer. The idea of like uh, in, in the Old Testament where Jacob's wrestling with God and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. It's similar to David when he's praying for the life of his son. And he will not stop. He does not stop until he is told that his son has died. And so they wrestle in prayer. They plead with God in prayer. So we urge them to plead for mercy, better compassion. And compassion is described in the Bible as an attribute of God. In Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, it says, The Lord passed by in front of him, that is Moses, and proclaimed this. This is the word of God, God's witness, his testimony to his own nature. God says this, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. God's very nature is to be compassionate. It's, it's part of his essence. And so, in, in one sense, they are claiming the promises of Scripture. God, we are coming to you with this request because we know that you have revealed yourself as a God of compassion. That you're a merciful God. Not only are you omniscient and not only are you all-powerful, but you are a God who is loving and gracious and merciful and compassionate. This is the type of God that we go to in prayer. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven. Now, this is another interesting phrase here, the God of heaven. It occurs in verse 18, verse 19, verse 37, verse 44. And according to commentator Andrew Hill, uh, the name speaks of God's transcendence and supremacy over all that is temporal and earthbound. God is sovereign and transcends all things. He knows all things. And so this is right in the realm of, of, of God. They're not asking something that is beyond God or too difficult. This is right in God's sphere. More than that, the phrase could be rendered the God who is over the heavens, which, as E.J. Young noted, would imply that Yahweh is over the sun, moon, and stars which the Babylonians worshipped. So the reason why the, the, the Babylonian wise men and all their occultic practices couldn't do anything is, is because they didn't exist. Not as deities. They're worshipping the sun and the moon and the stars as though they're, they're divine. They're just part of creation. They're creatures, inanimate creatures. But there is a God who is over all of those and he's not inanimate. He is the true and living God. He is the Lord Almighty. It seems to be a very common epithet for God in the exilic and post-exilic period. So right around the time of Daniel, just before and just after. It occurs a whole bunch of times in Ezra. Ezra chapter 1 verse 2, chapter 5 verses 11 and 12, chapter 6 verses 9 and 10, chapter 7 verse 12, verse 21, verse 23, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 4, verse 5, chapter 2 verse 4 and verse 20. So in this general period of time, it was a common phrase for God and probably contrasted their God with the pagan so-called gods around them. They made gods of created things. And isn't that what Paul said in Romans chapter 1? They worship the creation rather than the creator. Plead for mercy, compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now again here, there's a theological point. It's not merely that Daniel and his friends don't want to die. I'm certain that's part of the their rationale here. But the more important theological point for Daniel and the others is they don't want to be lumped in with this group. They don't want to be seen by everybody else as part of this occultic group. 
this group of charlatans, this group of godless men. They want to be seen as distinct, as those who are on Yahweh's side, on the side of the Lord, not on the side of all these pretenders. And so they're very concerned with their personal testimony in all this. And so they want God to answer this, not merely so that they won't be put to death, but so that God would be exalted and glorified. There's a doxological purpose here, which is to be the purpose for our existence. The Apostle Paul said that all things were made by him and for him. We exist for the the, the glory of God to manifest his glory. And Daniel is greatly concerned that in this God would be glorified. What an amazing testimony. How many of us, if we were thinking or facing you know, execution, wouldn't our first priority be our own skin? And yet Daniel's first priority is the glory of God. Wonderful lessons to learn here. Verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Now, visions in Scripture, even in the book of Daniel, could be given while somebody is asleep or while they're awake. The context tells you which. A, a few scholars, such as Leon Wood, have suggested that Daniel and the others, they've spent time in prayer, and then rest assured that God has heard their prayer, then they went to sleep. I don't think that fits the context at all, and I don't think that fits what our experience would be. I think it's far more akin to what I had suggested before about, about David praying for the life of his son. Sleep isn't on the priority list. For David, cleaning up and eating, these sorts of things weren't on the priority list. Interceding for his son was the only priority. And there's no way that Daniel and his friends are going to sleep that night. There's praying to be done. There's work to be done. There's intercession to be done. And so they pray and they pray and they pray and they pray. Until at last, during the night, God revealed to Daniel the mystery. What does Daniel do? Then what does Daniel do? He praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. Verse 21 is probably also in light of the, the, the dream and its interpretation that he sees, which has to do with the succession of kings and kingdoms. And God is sovereign over all these things. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. Um, John Golden Gay is rightly noted here that when it says he gives wisdom to the wise, he's not saying if people are already wise, he just heaps more upon them. The wise are those who are spiritually wise because they are indwelt by the Spirit. In other words, as one commentator said, the wise are those who are believers. They have been regenerate by the power of the Holy Spirit. They are therefore able to spiritually discern these matters. Remember the Apostle Paul says that, that, that the, the unbeliever cannot discern the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. Apart from the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, they, they can't put two and two together. They're blinded by the God of this age. And so the wise here are those who are true believers, the regenerate. And the regenerate, when they seek God for wisdom, he gives them wisdom. He gives them knowledge because through the Spirit, they're discerning. And so he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. They're only deep and hidden to us, not to God. He knows what lies in the darkness. He's, he's omniscient. And light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. Notice he includes uh, his friends there because Daniel's not saying, well, God, you answered my prayer. That must mean that I'm more spiritual than my three friends. No, there's something about corporate prayer that is powerful. And this is why 
the most neglected meeting, meeting of the church, the prayer meeting, should be the most important meeting of the church. Because God does magnificent, wondrous things when his people gather to pray. The scriptures say that God's house is to be what? A house of prayer. His people gathering to pray. And Daniel and his friends prayed and God answered. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Stephen Miller writes, faith is evident in the words of these verses as well. Daniel trusted that the revelation was accurate and he thanked God for the information before he had even heard the king confirm it. He hasn't told Nebuchadnezzar the dream and the interpretation and then Nebuchadnezzar said, well, that's exactly what I dreamed. He assumes, he trusts in God that what God revealed to him was true and trustworthy. We see Daniel's faith written all through this. He doesn't have an abstract relationship with God. He has a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. Furthermore, the whole context, beginning in verse 16, demonstrates his amazing faith. Nowhere in Israel's history are we told that God revealed the contents of a dream and its interpretation to someone, not even Joseph. Daniel rightly believed that God knows all things. His omniscience is plainly stated in numerous passages, including Psalm 147, verse 5, which says, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. Theologians call this that, that God has exhaustive knowledge. God knows everything actual, everything hypothetical. God cannot learn or obtain new information. He knows everything. His understanding is infinite. 1 John 3.20 says, God knows all things. And so when Daniel is praying, he's praying in faith because God already knows. He doesn't have to pray to a God and say, God, do you think you can figure this one out for me? God knows. Plus, we already know that God is the source of the dream anyways. Also, Daniel rationalized, as Nebuchadnezzar did, that if, in fact, God knew the interpretation of the dream, he must know the content of the dream itself. It, it's just... Basic logic. How, how would God know the interpretation of the dream if he didn't know the dream? Verse 24, Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah, who can tell the king what his dream means. Well, opportunity was knocking for Arioch, so he took a little bit of the credit. I have found a man who can interpret your dream. Perhaps trying to get a little bit of a promotion out of this. We don't know. Other scholars have also suggested that there's probably a sense of relief on Arioch's part. Assuming he's not some sort of sick, twisted man who gets enjoyment out of executing people, uh, knowing that Daniel is about to tell the king his dream and, and, and uh, give the interpretation would mean that probably he doesn't have to go through that gruesome task now of, of rounding up and executing the wise men. So there's a sense of relief for him as well. Verse 26, the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Scholars say that there is a note here of, of uh, uh, the king is, is not, you know, he's not holding his breath here. He's assuming that Daniel's going to come and, and try to weasel his way out of it or, or something. So some incredulity on the part of Nebuchadnezzar in this language. Daniel replied this, can you do it? No. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. 
He has just thrown the entire wise man system under the bus. He's just said, this whole system is worthless. It can't do what it claims to do. And we already saw last time that even out of their own mouths, they said that. They said, well, only the gods know this and they don't dwell among us. We don't have contact with them. Well, isn't that exactly what you claim to, to have? Contact with the gods? So this demonstrates that theme of the fact that false religion is worthless. In fact, it's worth, worse than worthless. It's ruinous. No, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain the king the mystery he has asked. And I love this. Verse 28. But. But there is a God in heaven. This is a glorious statement. This statement changes everything. Okay, the reason your wise men can't do it is because there are no little G-O-Ds. And so no human can do what you're asking them to do. But there is a God in heaven. Let that soak in for a minute here. There is a God in heaven. It reminds me of one of the most impactful passages in Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 3 say, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest." So it paints a, a, a picture of that. We're all sinners. We're all under the just wrath of God. Then comes verses 4 and 5. But God. The only reason why there is salvation. The only reason why there is any hope in this world. Is that statement. But God. God took the initiative. But God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Daniel had an incredible belief in God. A belief in God as he has revealed himself in Scripture. Not a caricature, caricature of God, but he had a true picture of God as God has revealed himself through Scripture. God is indescribable, majestic, all-powerful, wise, gracious, merciful, compassionate, all-knowing, sovereign, and above all else, worthy of praise, adoration, and worship. That's why Daniel's first response is to praise God, to worship Him. Why? Because He's worthy. Even if God didn't respond... He is still worthy. God is worthy in and of himself. That's why Job can say, The Lord give it, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Circumstances do not change the nature of God. God is good. God is gracious, compassionate, loving. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. This phrase, in the days to come, can have different nuances depending on the context. Uh, some scholars render, think it's just about the eschaton, the, the very last portion uh, of history before uh, the second coming of Christ. That doesn't fit the context at all. It's a broader term, probably analogous to the New Testament. We say, in the last days. Well, the last days refers to from the ascension of Christ until the second coming. It's a broad, broad term. Or it can be used narrowly of, of, of the coming of Christ. But here it's a broad term from the time of, of the dream, time of Nebuchadnezzar, right through to the coming of Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth. And so Nebuchadnezzar is, is getting 
this, this whole picture. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. So here's the dream. As you were lying there, O oh king, your mind turned to things to come. Not the same things to come as we just said about in the last days. Nebuchadnezzar is self-centered. Nebuchadnezzar cares about one thing. Nebuchadnezzar. What he's thinking about is what's going to happen with me and my kingdom. That's all he's concerned about. Is there going to be a coup, an assassination, a, a, another empire come and crush us? He wants to know what's going to happen. How long am I going to live in rain? Is it going to be a good rain or a bad rain? What's going to happen? He wants to know the future. And God gives him way more than, than what he's thinking about. As you were lying there, verse 29, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mystery showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Notice the contrast between Arioch and Daniel. Arioch goes in and says, I have found. Daniel is doing everything in his power to get out of the way. Nebuchadnezzar, this has nothing to do with me. I'm not giving you uh, the dream and its interpretation because there's anything special in me. And he just points to God. Daniel's concern is the glory of God. He wants to make God look good all the time. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue is made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Uh, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron and the clay, notice the reverse order now. Uh, it's a chiasm where you go first and last, second, second, last, and so forth. Um, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were broken into pieces at the same time, showing there's continuity with the kingdoms. Really, they're viewed as one kingdom here. It's the kingdom of man versus the kingdom of God. Man in rebellion versus God. Okay, we're going right back to the Tower of Babel. Man in revolt and God establishing his kingdom. So it broke them to pieces at the same time. It became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept away the, without leaving a trace. So when God's done, nothing of man in revolt will be left. And we know from the book of Revelation, when God's finally done, it says, and he will make all things new. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, the details of this, we're going to look at next, next time. It's, it's a whole message to work through what this is. But essentially what he says is because... He tells them in the interpretation that this is dealing with kingdoms. Okay, so verse 36. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. Notice again the sovereignty of God. The only reason why Nebuchadnezzar is in the position he is in is because God has graciously put him there. Remember the references in chapter 1? So we have at the beginning, we have... And the Lord, this is verse 2, handed over, delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. It was God. Then we see Daniel going to Ashpenaz. And it talked about God giving or handing him over favor. And then it talks the, the, the third time in Daniel chapter 1 about God handing over, delivering, or giving him wisdom and, and knowledge in, in all of their, their curriculum. And Daniel had the ability to interpret dreams. It's the sovereignty of God. It's God's gracious provision 
all through it, and the same thing here. So again, God is being glorified because he says, whoa, 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 Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold, and Nebuchadnezzar is probably going, wow, I, that means I'm the greatest. He said, no, 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 no. The only reason you're there is because there is one above you that you are accountable to, and he has put you there for his purposes. Now let's apply this to our lives. Any success or good thing you have in your life has been given to you by God for God. We need to live that way. The New Testament makes it very clear. What do you have that was not given to you, Paul says? So why do you act as though it was not given to you? You, O king, he says, the God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory in your hands. He has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise, which tells us that the gold actually doesn't refer just to Nebuchadnezzar, but to the Neo-Babylonian empire of which he is the head. And he's the head in more than one sense because we'll look at the details next time, but the, the Neo-Babylonian Empire was a short-lived empire. Daniel lives through the whole thing and then beyond. And Nebuchadnezzar was the king for three quarters of it. And so it is true in one sense to say that he is the head of gold because things fizzle out quickly after him. You have king, 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 and, and none of them are any good. But Nebuchadnezzar was known throughout the ancient Near Eastern world as one of the greatest kings that have ever lived from the human perspective. So he's the head of gold. After him comes another kingdom. So what's the statue about? What are the medals in relation to? One kingdom following another. And it even uses that. This one comes after. So they're not contemporaneous. One flows chronologically into the next. It will rise inferior to you. We don't know why it's inferior. We know that, that the metals that go, that are go have, a, have a descending and ascending order. Descending is value. Gold is worth more than silver and silver more and, than bronze and bronze more than, than iron. But the ascending order is in, in strength or hardness. You know, if you have pure gold, you can just bend it. But you get solid iron... And so you go in order of strength. So the inferiority here, as we'll look at the details, is probably speaking in the moral realm. And we'll talk about this. The world wasn't getting better, it was getting worse. Okay, so rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, uh, for iron breaks and smashes everything, and as iron breaks things into pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as so you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be the divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. Don't worry about the details, we'll, we'll pull these together next time. As the toes were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, now here we see the shift to the perception of viewing it as a whole or a totality. Man in revolt. Okay, so in the times of those kingdoms, where am I? Okay, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, uh, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is trust trustworthy and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of God, God's and the Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. He doesn't become a convert to Yahwism. 
He's still a polytheist. But Nebuchadnezzar is a henotheist, which means he's a polytheist, but he exalts one God above all. And, it, and what we know about Nebuchadnezzar is his, his favorite God was Marduk, who was considered in Babylon to be the head God. But we're probably seeing a shift here. Well, if the enchanters and wise men and all these people couldn't get Marduk to reveal this, your God must be the God of gods. Your God must be better than Marduk, but he's still a polytheist. Okay, so your God surely is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. By the way, verse 48 is the reason, the number one reason why um, <clears throat> chapter 1 should, and, and 2 should be in chronological order. Remember last time I said there's some debate whether the events here take place prior to Daniel's graduation or after this verse suggests that they had already graduated. It, it doesn't make any sense that if Daniel is, is promoted here to basically second in command in the kingdom, why then does he have to stand before King Nebuchadnezzar to be tested to see if he can graduate? It doesn't make any sense. It makes much better sense to see that he had graduated and then shortly thereafter this whole scenario happens and Daniel is then promoted. So basically, he goes from a, a new grad to number one within probably a few, few weeks. Now, Daniel being Daniel, recognizes that he shouldn't be the one that gets all the, all the, the recognition or the reward because one, it was God, not him. But number two, Daniel assumes that it wasn't just in response to his prayer, but at the prayer of the group. And so Daniel goes to the king and says, King, whoa, whoa, whoa. Thanks, but this came about not just because of me, but because we prayed. We pleaded for compassion from our God, and he answered. So Nebuchadnezzar sees that it's a group effort, and so he rewards them all, but he rewards Daniel supremely. So moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the court. That's a lot. That's a lot. And we'll go through the details next time. But uh, I want you to focus here especially on the character, the example of Daniel, his prayer life, his faith, the way in which he uses circumstances to promote the truth and to glorify God. Notice at the beginning, he could have just said, okay, here, king, here's the dream. He doesn't do that. He says, no, no, king, nobody can do this, but there is a God in heaven. He's giving glory to God. And every opportunity we have, we should be giving glory to God. We should be making him known. We should find ways in which to make Christ glorified, to, to present the gospel. Don't just wait for the door to fling through it. Push the door open. Have in mind at all times the glorification of God, to magnify his name, to magnify Christ, and to live in a way that makes the gospel a reality, that people see the gospel in our lives. They see a difference, a change. We see on the news every week now about some Christian leader following, falling away, and getting themselves into all sorts of immorality and things like that. And, and it's just, the world looks at the church and they see hypocrites. Well, I can't control anybody else, but I need to make sure that I'm not a hypocrite. And you need to make sure that you're not a hypocrite. And when then somebody sees you, they see Christ. We have died to self. It is no longer I who live, but Christ, what? lives in me. Do they see Christ living in you? They certainly did in Daniel. That's why people were, 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 were drawn to him. Is because God blessed Daniel in his faithfulness. Because Daniel lived with the right priorities. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this portion of scripture. And Lord, we, we look at your sovereignty, but we also look at the life of Daniel and how much, Lord, this, this, this young man and his, his three friends, they were probably 18, 19 years old, 
and the example that they set for us. Lord, may we be like Daniel in this. May our faith always be on display. May we live an uncompromising life. May we live in a way, Lord, that looks for every opportunity to glorify you and make you known and make your gospel known. That would be our great ambition and desire, and it would flow, Lord, out of obedience to the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and all our strength. So, Lord, be pleased with us. Equip us by uh, the Holy Spirit to live out these truths that we would not be merely hearers of the word, but doers of it. Transform us by the power of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.